So if you have questions, please type them in the chat or use the Q&A function as we will have a Q&A portion at the end of tonight's presentation. Uh, the presentation will be recorded. So if you miss any portion, it will be available on our Conservation Nebraska YouTube channel in a few weeks. Uh, at the end of the presentation, we'll have a really short four question survey pop up on your screen. And if you're able to complete this, we greatly appreciate it. It helps us improve in the future to bring you more engaging content. Um, okay, uh, I will let you go ahead now, Dan. Well, thank you, Kat. I really appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk about uh, uh, my favorite subject, which is uh, nuclear power. I think it's very, very important for the state as we go forward. And uh, I hope to be able to uh, make this a little bit interactive. So if you have questions, please don't hesitate on asking. Uh, uh, but we'll uh, I'll start off by getting a screen shared here. Um, Here we go. And uh, Kat, you can see the screen okay? Excellent. So uh, again, uh, as Kat said, my name is Dan Buman. I am the Director of Nuclear Oversight and Strategic Asset Management for Nebraska Public Power. Uh, tonight, what we're gonna go over, uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit about how, uh, how we make uh, energy, nuclear energy production, storage, uh, disposal, transportation, safety. We're also gonna kind of talk about how, how does this fit into the broader system of electrical, um, uh, the electrical grid, kind of look at the costs and benefits surrounding communities, and then looking at what's the future of, uh, of nuclear power. So we'll start off here first, uh, looking at the energy production. So in, in essence, you know, if, if you look at any other uh, way of, uh, of making steam or making heat, uh, nuclear is, is just uses uh, uranium. There is two types of uranium atoms. There is a, a lighter uranium atom called uranium-235 that has 235 uh, uh, neutrons and protons in the uh, in, in the nucleus. Um, the more common one is uranium-238, but there is a small amount. So what we take is typically about um, a 5% enrichment of uh, uranium-235. And what happens is you see over here on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, you have a, a neutron that's been slowed down to the proper energy level that will take and strike the nucleus. When it, when it gets into there, it, it doesn't just, it's not like a billiard ball or anything, but it goes in there and it's absorbed in and it excites the uh, nucleus and it splits into two different uh, uh, fragments. When it does that, it gives off a lot of heat, plus it has the two fragments, plus it has additional uh, uh, neutrons uh, that that would uh, carry, the, carry the reaction, keep it going. How we manage and maintain this is you notice that they say that they're fast neutrons. The fast neutrons, when they hit the uranium-235, won't interact with that. So, so what we have to do is we have to basically slow that down. So we have ways of slowing that down, and we have ways of capturing those neutrons, and that's how we maintain and manage uh, the nuclear reaction uh, to be able to uh, generate the heat. That heat, as you can see over here in the vessel, is if you have water surrounding it. That turns the heats the water, turns it to steam. From the steam, you see it coming on out. It comes through the steam lines, comes over to the turbine, which causes it to spin. That's connected to a generator, which obviously then uh, uh, provides electricity and goes out to the uh, to the to the grid, out to the homes. Uh, the steam that's in there comes on down and is uh, is captured in our condenser. And we take water then from the Missouri River, we pump it through the condenser and pump it back out. Now, this is all a closed system that's in here. This condenser is all at a vacuum. So if there's any sort of leaks or anything uh, from, from the river or anything, it would leak into the condenser versus anything of coming on out. But all that steam then is condensed back to water. It's then taken and through some high pressure pumps and it's pumped right back into the, into the vessel. So this water, we don't really use, we, we use the same water over and over again. It turns to steam, we condense it, we pump it right on back. We take water from the river, we pump it on in and we pump it right back out to the river again. So we're not really consuming water, but we do, uh, we do use that to be able to manage 
manage the plant and be able to uh, produce the electricity. So to give you some sort of idea, you know, the, the, the uranium, we'll, we'll have other pictures in here, but the uranium really is um, little tiny pellets and you take about five of those pellets together, that's about the size of a, of a crayon without the tip. And if you look at the amount of energy that's stored in there, that's uh, huge amounts uh, of, of energy. So those five uranium fuel pellets, that's the equivalent of um, roughly 15 barrels of oil, uh, five tons of coal, um, or 85,000 cubic feet of natural gas. So all of that that's in there, that's inside the core, all that energy is available to us, and that's why we're able to operate. So what we will do is once every two years, we will go into a refueling outage. We will take about a third of the core, and we'll take that out, and we'll put in some new fuel bundles in and take the old ones out. The fuel bundles that go in there will be in the, in the core for about six years. Uh, at the end of the six years, we discharge those on out, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But again, shows you how much energy is, is in that. So when we talk of the fuel bundles over here on the right-hand side, you can see that we take all those pellets, and all those pellets go into these little, what looks like little, uh, little pipes. Um, those pellets fit inside there. They're sealed in there. It's welded, uh, and, and there's uh, uh, helium gas that's in there to keep it inert. And so when, when the reaction is going, all of that stays inside intact and the water runs up through here and that's what causes the heat. So you put these all these pins, you put in uh, uh, these fuel rods. So in each of these fuel rods that you go in there, there's 92 fuel rods per bundle. There's 548 bundles. There are uh, 50,000 uh, fuel rods in total in the core, which comes up to um, uh, almost 19 million uh, fuel pellets. And if you're talking about a uh, number of fuel pellets, that's basically 19 uh, million tons of coal, the equivalent that we have that's in there. So a lot of energy that's in the core, that's how we're able to continue and operate for long periods of time without shutting down. When we start up, we will operate at 100% power. Typically, uh, we'll come down for testing on a quarterly basis, uh, slight you know, to about 80% power and maybe doing some testing, but otherwise we operate at 100% power for the remaining uh, two years. So when you look at the fuel, this is this is actual pictures of the fuel uh, fuel pellet uh, fuel bundles. We they don't have the outside um, uh, channel up, uh, so it comes in, it's unpacked. You'll notice the. People that are standing there very closely, they're only wearing the white gloves. The white gloves are not there to protect them from the fuel. It's really to protect the fuel from them. So they have to look, we have to do inspections to make sure that there is no, uh, um, any sort of lint, any sort of uh, uh, debris, anything else that could be damaging onto those uh, uh, fuel rods that are in there. So what we want to do is we want to examine that. When we get done, we will put a channel around the outside of that, basically encases it. We'll put that down into the spent fuel pool. It'll be going down into water. And after that particular point, it will, it will stay underwater until we discharge that out to the dry storage fuel. So that when, you, when you're looking on down, uh, this you're, what you're seeing here is actually Cooper. They were, they're disassembling. They're taking the head of the reactor vessel off. So it gives you some sort of idea of the size that you have. You can also see the, the bolts that they currently have that are down there. Uh, with someone uh, going there, we have uh, we have a, a more modern carousel now that takes them off a much much quicker and provides a, a, a more firm, but it gives you an idea of the size and and complexity we're talking about. Once this cover and all these bolts are loose, they'll take and pull that head up. And they'll lift it off. Then they'll start filling up that whole area that's in there. You notice it looks like it's uh, all kinds of uh, stainless steel. Uh, it basically fill it full of water and that becomes a, a big pool of water and that water provides basically a shielding for us, additional shielding. And here's what, what you're actually doing now. What you're looking at here is you're actually looking on down. They fill that whole cavity up now and everything's underwater and they're working underwater. Here in the center, you see uh, something coming on down. What it's doing is that's, that's part of our refueling bridge and this is a telescoping wand comes down 
And what you're doing is you're looking down here at the very bottom, you're looking down through about 60 feet of water. So it's very high purity water that you're going through uh, to be able to go down. They'll go down, they'll reach, and there's a little grapple on the top. You'll grab a hold of that bundle when they have it secured and they know they have the right one, they'll pull it out. This, this will come up. They'll always maintain at least 14 feet of water between them that provides shielding. And then what they'll do is they'll take this and they'll they'll basically go through this area over here to the spent fuel pool, which will be flooded up and it's at the same level as that water. And they're able to maintain and do all this work underwater during this entire time frame. So I said it was it would stay underwater. So uh, once once we have it and we discharge after six years, we discharge the uh, uh, the fuel. There's still energy in the fuel, and so it will still uh, continue to generate some amount of heat. So what we have is we have storage. We have a, you're looking down into a spent fuel pool, and you see that we have racks in there where we can store the fuel. And what you're seeing over here on the side is an actual fuel bundle. Uh, and they're moving it on over and they'll put it into one of these storage bins that are in there. So inside the plant, it's cooled and shielded under 20 feet uh, of water. Uh, and again, like I said, when they lift it up, the top of the bundle is never any, uh, any closer than 14 feet. Um, so it's maintained in there. It's protected from any sort of tornadoes, any sort, <clears throat> any sort of uh, damage that could occur. And uh, uh, it is... Um, and we have uh, backup uh, power that that's able to keep and continuously make sure that the fuel pool always stays cool. Uh, after about six years or more, uh, the energy will have decayed enough that we'll be able to actually take that out. We'll be able to store it outside uh, outside the plant. And I'll show you pictures of that. And so what we would end up doing is we'll go in, we'll take these same bundles, we'll put them into a little cask, and uh, we will seal the cask, drain it, and it will be into outside storage and robust dry cask storage systems. And you know, I'll show you some pictures of that. Um, the other things that we're eventually, that, that is being looked at and that the Department of Energy is currently uh, evaluating again is looking at uh, away from the plant consolidated facilities for more efficient management. So right now it's stored right at Cooper and it's stored at all of the nuclear plants, but they're looking at being able to consolidate it. And that just becomes a little bit more efficient um, uh, way of managing it. Uh, you're still, we could extract more energy by recycling or re, uh, reusing the fuel. That is something that is being looked at. And especially as we start talking about small uh, modular reactors, that's a potential. Uh, and then also looking at uh, permanent uh, disposal in, uh, into a deep geological repository. More and more, they're looking at it, though, as saying that they don't, uh, with, with the new technologies that they have, they, would, they have, would have energy that would almost make this almost limitless energy just based on, on what uh, we currently have. So we talked a little bit about uh, dry cask, and, and what you're seeing over here in the lower left-hand corner is basically a cask. So you can see the bundles can fit down into here. This whole cask is put down underwater. Uh, so it's filled full of water. We fill it with our, our particular ones has about 168 fuel bundles in each one. And then what they will end up doing is they'll lift it up. Once they get it up, you'll see over here in the upper left hand corner, they'll put a lid on top of it and they'll seal it. And they'll do a seal weld around there. And so they, now what you have, is you have the bundles of fuel that's in there. And what they'll do is they'll drain this out, fill it full of helium. And eventually they'll take this and they'll put it into a storage that's a concrete storage bunker that goes into here, slides into there, and it's basically then protected. It needs no electricity, it needs no cooling, everything is passive. It's just natural, uh, natural cooling where it's, it's maintained and it's monitored. Um, so you can see that the, there's a lot of defense in depth in here. Um, all of these, there's no moving parts that we need. Uh, we, we basically have, have time, they become very, very safe to be stored there. This is a picture of the cask over on the left-hand side coming up and out of the water. So you can see that they're raising this up. They'll bring it on over. They'll have a robot that will seal weld the plate on top. And as I said, then they'll drain the water out of it. Uh, they'll pull a, a vacuum to make sure it's purged. They'll fill it full of helium. 
and then it will basically go out. It'll be put on to, uh, uh, onto a heavy hauler that you see over here on the right-hand side. And it goes over here to one of these concrete storage and it'll be pushed into there where it'll be stored until uh, sometime in the future when, uh, when they want to pull this on back. And again, they could reuse portions of this fuel and the DOE is starting to look at that as a serious option again. This has been used quite quite heavily over in Europe. Uh, the United States has chosen not to do that, but again, we're re-looking at that as, as we speak. And then this is just the picture of the uh, storage facilities that are sitting there. So this is down at Cooper um, and you know, everybody, some, some people would sit there and say, well, it's, it's down there, what happens with floods? They're designed to operate under 50 feet of water. So um, in fact, they had this sort of design uh, over at Fukushima. And when the tidal waves came in, they they were perfectly fine. Uh, they had no damage. Um, they've they've done the inspections over there. There has been nothing. So again, you know, the, from from that aspect, they're they're very very safe. They're very passive. Uh, you see down here along the bottom these openings. Uh, what they what they have is they have a grate, and air is drawn into there. And it, as it warms, just from the heat, it comes out. And so we're constantly monitoring the temperature. We're monitoring if anything would, would be going in there, make sure that we don't have any sort of bird's nests or anything like that, um, you know, and, and monitor it. It's a very slow, slow temperature rise, but we would be able to pick that up. if We saw anything as much as uh, five degrees temperature. If you were to go out there and touch this, it's not that it's hot or anything like that, but it would typically be about five degrees warmer than uh, than the ambient temperature is outside. So on a cold day, you can feel some warmth. Obviously, that's that's dissipating a lot of a lot of heat. Uh, but even on a hot day, you go out there and you wouldn't even be able to tell the difference on that. Uh, eventually, uh, those casks would be able to go into a, uh, a transportation cask. And a transportation cask, you see it sitting here on a, a rail car. Uh, if you if you're interested, you can certainly go out and look at. Uh, they they've tested these casks extensively. They've uh, they've uh, shot missiles at them. They've hit them with uh, with trains, um, and they they basically are strong integrity casks. The idea would be that if we were ever to uh, take this and uh, uh, take it to a consolidated facility, this is how we would end up transporting them to get them safely from one spot to the other. This upper right-hand corner here, you see this Holtec missile test, and you can actually see them. They're firing a missile right at it to make sure and seeing if it's going to be able to survive. Um, so what about, uh, where does nuclear fit in the broader electrical system? Well, obviously you have the generation up here at the top, the variety of different sources that can come on in, uh, power plants. Uh, we, we basically then take the, we, when we generate it, we generate uh, roughly at uh, 24,000 volts. Um, we then have transformers that step that up and it, we step it up to 345. It goes out through the very large lines that you see. And eventually as it gets closer to where it's gonna be used, it goes to sub transmission lines and eventually gets down to distribution. And then down here at the bottom, down to the, uh, to the residential. So um, NPPD, has, uh, has so so we have generation facilities all across the state. Um, we have a very diverse generation portfolio. Uh, we believe that that's uh, the best way of to uh, uh, do, have derive uh, en energy value for Nebraskans. So we have uh, coal, we have wind, we have hydro, we have solar, we have gas and oil, and we have nuclear. And we have that all across the state. And it's really kind of a balance. And, and just like uh, if you were looking at a 401k, you always want to make sure that you have a diverse portfolio. We believe that it's very important to have a diverse generation portfolio. So this is one of the reasons why you, why you need to have this. Now, this is actual uh, what we actually saw from MPVD, the MPVD load versus wind production. Now, these are not both to scale, but it gives you some sort of idea. The, the blue line is what the load is that we're trying to serve. And we have to provide all the electricity. Uh, when, when you turn on a switch, you expect the lights to be there and we would expect them to be there also. So we have to provide that, but we don't really have a storage way. So 
whatever we we have to constantly generate and we have to match generation to whatever is being used. And so what you're seeing throughout the year here is um, in the winter, in January, it starts off, you can see the loads fairly low, it kind of comes up, and then during the springtime, it drops down. We don't see a lot, you know, it's fairly mild, you don't have air conditioning, you have some winter loads here. During the summer, we see a lot of irrigation loads, and so you see that's where we have our peak. Then again, during the fall, it comes on down in October, you see it gets fairly low, and then again, you see it starts building up, and for the winter time, again, when it turns cold, we see a little bit more. Now, when you compare that to the green line, the green line is the wind generation and wind generation will generate at any time as long as the wind's blowing. But you see that they're not always in sync. So what we have to do is we have to be able to match that. So when the wind's not blowing, we have to have a way to be able to do that uh, to cover the load. You know, when when the wind's fairly low and we have a fairly high uh, load factor there. So. One of the ways that we do that is we use Cooper Nuclear Station, which runs base load, as I said, at 100% power. Uh, by doing that, what we're able to do is it does not produce any sort of uh, carbon. It does not pr produce any sort of uh, emissions. And uh, so we're able to balance that and keep that in a constant uh, uh, constant uh, steady state. It, it's physically located. You can see here the picture of the plant. It's physically located three miles south of Brownville. Uh, it's 820 megawatts. Um, it is a boiling water reactor. Again, I said it, uh, we talked about it runs on a what we call a 24 month fuel cycle, which means it will run for 24 months, 100% power, uh, 24 7. And, um, you know, it, it's been very effective at doing that um, from, a, from an oversight perspective. We've, uh, we've been in the best uh, column. Uh, they, they rank. The NRC ranks and, and provides oversight. There are physically two inspectors that are there. Um, basically 365 days a year, there's additional inspectors that will come in to make sure that what, what we're doing, what they're doing is validating that we're, uh, we're operating safely and we're operating within the regulations. Um, we, they will then rank and based upon um, how, you know, if there's violations or other things, you are ranked into a column and we have been ranked in the best column since 2012. So again, you know, it's been, we've had a very good safety record as we've been going forward. We also have um, uh, in uh, Institute of Nuclear Power Operations. Uh, they are an outfit that um, um, is kind of self-regulating and what they're due, the NRC is regulating towards compliance. The uh, INPO or the Institute of Nuclear Power Operators uh, uh, they, what they do is they are uh, looking at excellence. And so looking at how well we are doing, how, uh, you know, the, our performance, how, uh, how we've been performing, they've ranked us, uh, they'll rank you either exemplary, strong, um, uh, you know, various different categories. We've been ranked at the top of exemplary best rating category uh, since 2016. So we've been one of, um, uh, one of about, uh, 30 different units that have uh, have that have that ranking. Um, our security force has been uh, also we have a we have a security force that that constantly monitors and makes sure and protects to make sure that there would be no radiological uh, sabotage or anything that comes in. They will actually uh, perform um, some force on force uh, exercises where they mock having a mock assault come in trying to see and test how well they uh, they perform. They performed very, very well. In fact, they're one of the top ranked security forces in the nation. And based upon all that, we've been establishing new records in performance as, as uh, over the last several years and continue to do so. So again, we talked about the, the diversity, um, uh, you know, we've operated, you know, near continuous record. Uh, we had a continuous record of 696 days operation. Um, we have a very high, what's called uh, capacity factor. We're very resilient and safely operate through extreme weather events. So when the weather turned, you know, weather storm, storm URI came in, we continued to operate during that entire time frame, 100% power. Uh, in 2019, when the floods, um, when we had severe flooding for um, 
for, for almost 300 some days nonstop, uh, we were able to uh, continuously operate at 100% power. So we're, we're, except for the outages, we're always online running 24 seven nonstop. Uh, we provide enough energy for, uh, at, at their peaks, 385,000 homes at, at a peak, you know, so when the air conditionings are running or the furnaces are going, uh, we have that much uh, power available. So the diverse, we talked about diverse generation portfolio. So how, what does that do for us? Well, what we've been able to do by, by keeping that together is you can see that we've been able, we typically will, uh, look at this on a two year rolling average. And so every every two years, we'll sit there and look at what, what was the amount of energy that we sold to our Nebraska customers, how much of that was carbon free. And uh, the last two years, we were at 56%. We typically run in the ranges of 60 to uh, 65%. The last refueling outage that we had, uh, uh, we had a uh, had to run a little bit longer. We didn't. We weren't able to get uh, some of the additional resources. Um, we we bring in uh, literally uh, hundreds. We bring in about eight hundred some people in to be able to do that. We we came up uh, short. So based upon that, we had to extend our outage out a little bit longer than what we had originally anticipated. So we had a little bit of a longer outage, and based upon that, we we ended up at fifty six percent. But again, over fifty percent of the power. Uh, for them was carbon free. That also, you know, we sit there and look at price. That's the other part of that is sitting there looking at, you can see that the price is, has been steadily been able to control the costs based upon that. And so again, that's what the diverse energy uh, generation portfolio does for us. So if we look at what uh, surrounding communities, you know, one of the one of the big impacts, you know, there's a very big economic impact in the local economy. Um, we have roughly 660 jobs uh, right there at the site uh, full time. Uh, in addition, uh, there are additional people that are supporting that. So you see that it supports more than a thousand Nebraska jobs during uh, the refueling outage. Um, you know, we have a source uh, where, where we have between 1800 and 2000 additional jobs. Uh, during the refueling outages, and uh, we basically in uh, we're looking at 112 million annually in state economic output, including 66 million just in the five neighboring counties around there. From an environmental impact, we talked about that on a rolling two-year average, we're roughly right around 60% uh, uh, of Nebraska's customers uh, are able to get electricity carbon-free. Um, and in the latest one, we contributed to, of that, we contributed 42.3% uh, from Cooper. So if we look at going forward and, uh, you know, Cooper is currently licensed to 2034. At the end of that license, we will, um, we'll, we will be uh, deciding here shortly of whether we're going to basically shut down and at that particular time dismantle and turn the Turn the plant back. We have uh, we have we have the studies ready to go where we would be basically turning that back to a to a green field, um, taking all the fuel, all of the uh, any of the radioactive components and having them all and having that all back and putting it back to a pristine level. Or we've been making investments into the plant over over the last uh, uh, several years that says that extension going out to 2054 is quite feasible. So we're looking at, we're just completing up an integrated resource plan for our long-term generation, long-range generation needs through 2050. Um, that's being wrapped up. There's been several different uh, public sessions have been going, but it's looked at the different sources, what sort of electricity should we use? And based upon that, looking at where we wanted to go and being able to meet our carbon goals and everything else. We're looking at uh, uh, investing back into Cooper and uh, uh, we're currently doing a validation of the project cost and feasibility to extend the license out from 2034 out to 2054. So, you know, this plant has been, when, when we've been doing this, we've been going in and if you look at the plant, you know, it's it's been upgraded quite a little bit. There's uh, several different digital and modern 
technology that's in there. But again, you know, it's it's being maintained so that it's always reliable. In fact, when we've gone in, digital platforms have been able to help us improve our overall reliability because we typically have redundancy. We have we have uh, always at least a, a second one. Well, in these cases with the digital, we're going in with triple redundancy and be able to provide even make it even safer and even more reliable. Uh, so that's been into the plant. You know, if you if you look at the investment that NPVD has made over the years, it's it's made uh, put in over 600 million into the into the plant to be able to maintain that. And again, that's paying off and being able to allow us uh, to support longer generation uh, uh, from from Cooper. We'll be making the final decision on this uh, sometime either in the late 2023 or 2024 timeframe. When we get all the validation of project costs and the feasibility, get, that project is is completed, we'll be able to uh, uh, take that going forward. And if the board approves that, then we would go ahead and make a final decision, and we would apply for uh, an additional license that comes with additional inspections. We have aging management programs that are constantly monitoring the plant to make sure that all of our equipment, all the passive equipment, is still um, is still able to function as as we. Uh, as we believe, and we're going in and making whatever replacements and updates as we need. We've also invested in uh, the, the workforce. So the one thing is the plant. The other part is we've established partnerships with the local schools and colleges um, to basically develop and attract employee pipeline to support safe operation now and in the future so that we can continue this as we start going forward. Uh, the other thing out of the um, out of the integrated resource plan was to continue to look at new technologies such as small modular reactor. Uh, there's a variety of different things that uh, NPPD remains in. We're, we're working with a variety of outside groups uh, uh, looking at small reactor. We are currently in the middle of um, uh, looking across the state of Nebraska for potential sites, doing a preliminary siting study for uh, where would the next small modular reactor go if we were to do that? Uh, small modular reactor, that's something that's fairly new. They're, rather than having a large unit, they're much smaller. That provides them additional uh, margins uh, for passive components. So they don't have to have large equipments. They don't have to have electricity to be able to continue to cool them. So it enhances some of the safety and it also enhances some of the flexibility to be able to operate uh, when the wind is blowing and we're having able, typically Cooper will run, runs at 100% power, and we don't really move it around a lot. But again, you know, there's a lot of different designs that are available out there. There's a lot of different uh, technologies. The, these technologies have been used by uh, very safely by, uh, by, by the Navy and the Army. Uh, but again, you know, we haven't really been using them in the civilian workforce. And so there are currently about a dozen uh, demonstration projects across the United States that are uh, and in, in Canada that are underway looking at small modular reactors and building them off, <clears throat> excuse me. Obviously the first ones are, are very um, cost uh, prohibitive, but eventually after they build some of these and one of the other pieces, since they're smaller, that a lot of the components can actually be built at a factory versus be having to be shipped to a uh, to an on site. So looking at a lot of there's been a lot of excitement about that. Been able to site them close to uh, various different things like the hydrogen hub, which uh, NPPD is participating in to be able to use some sort of bridging strategy, be able to use the heat from uh, a nuclear power reactor. So you wouldn't be generating any carbon and be able to produce clean hydrogen or clean ammonia. Um, and ammonia, again, is another one of those sources of, a, of an interim fuel that we'd be able to use that, again, becomes carbon free. Um, we do participate uh, not only with the external advisory boards, EPRI, uh, which is a consortium of all of the different uh, um, electric uh, utilities, the Department of Energy, uh, Idaho National Labs. Um, so there's a lot of different, and even in some international developments, we're following all of those, following technologies, looking at what can we use, what would fit best, what fits best with renewables, given the intermittency of the of the wind and of the sun, that you'd be able to uh, use those that, that may be able to be a better match for the future as we start moving forward. 
Uh, we also participate heavily in the Advanced Nuclear Coalition. This is a group from Nebraska. Uh, and uh, in fact, we're coming up, I'll put a put a plug in later on in here in May, uh, in Lincoln, there'll be uh, uh, Advanced Nuclear Forum. Um, you can see the, uh, uh, the website down below, down there, advancednuclearcoalition.org. Uh, if you go there, you'd be able to register, you'd be able to look and see what they have. And again, it's a very, uh, uh, trying to look at and promote what can we do in Nebraska to be able to uh, uh, make this more welcoming. And so the siting technologies that we're currently looking at is we're looking at trying to be ready so that when those demonstration projects that I talked about, those uh, dozen or so across the, across the United States and across um, um, Canada, uh, when when the, all of them are looking at coming online somewhere towards the end of this decade, so we're looking at the 2029 to 2032 timeframe. Based on that, we'll look and see once they've been able to be demonstrated, we look at what the costs are, we'd be ready to go and we'd be sitting in, and having ourselves positioned to be able to invest into a small modular reactor if that's what uh, what the future looks like. So we've talked about a couple different ones. And again, what I'm showing you here is just kind of some different versions and the small modular reactors, they go anywhere from uh, very small, um, you know, in the five to 20 megawatt micro reactor uh, developments. These, these can be, you know, uh, theoretically, they could even be brought in via a truck. They're currently looking at one up in Alaska for an army base that's uh, going up there that they're gonna be bringing on in to be able to uh, provide power. And again, you, know, you can about imagine that when they get into some remote locations, obviously that provides just enough for the base that you would have there. You have um, light water, small modular reactors. Um, uh, again, they're showing the new scale. Um, there's also uh, various other technologies that are out there, um, roughly in the range of about, uh, you know, 200 to 300 megawatts. Uh, they have uh, uh, some of these others that are non-water cooled, um, high temperature gas reactors. They've used some of these. And again, this, this technology, it, uh, uh, it, it basically runs at a very low pressure. So therefore, you know, the, the, uh, the protection area is very, very small form. Um, you've heard a lot about uh, uh, Bill Gates uh, and he's been looking at turning some coal plants in in Wyoming and making and turning them into a nuclear power plant. That's TerraPower. That's a natrium reactor. You can see several of those are in development. And then uh, also some molten salt reactors again. So most of these are less than 300 megawatts, but what you can do is you can, you can gang them together, put two or three of them and they get them uh, so that you have even up to a thousand megawatts if you needed to. With that, that's the kind of the end of what I had. Is there any questions? Okay, let's look. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, the first question that we got was, what is the shielding quality of the water that is used? So shielding is very effective for uh, uh, for the for the fuel and for the radiation, it, it, as I said, you know, as long as we have, um, I, I believe the minimum amount is like 10 feet of water is, is provides the shielding. Our uh, tech specs are at uh, technical specifications say that we always maintain at least 12 feet and we typically use roughly right around 14 feet. But when you, when you have that much water between you and uh, a very highly radioactive core, you really don't see much, um, much dose up on the up on the refuel bridge and so able to manage that uh, people are maintained to very tight uh, guidances to make sure that we always uh, match and uh, make sure that the radiation levels uh, that people would would receive are are as low as achieve uh, reasonably achievable so uh, again we're looking at uh, thousands of a, of a ram and give you some sort of idea you know if you take a if you take an air flight across um, across the United States, you'd probably pick up roughly just based from the cosmic radiation and other things. You pick up roughly about twenty millirem. Well, we we would be managing down, and again, we manage to less than a millirem um, 
people that are doing a lot of work would would have more of that, but we have very tight uh, uh, guidelines that uh, make sure we always manage that into a very safe, uh, well below any areas where people see any sort of uh, um, um, any sort of damage from that. Hey, um, another question. Uh, regarding used fuel is that is it feasible to sell our used fuel to say Europe where it could be recycled so, so there's a there there is a a lot of there, there's I'll put it this way there is a lot of value in the fuel um, we have because of the way that we've managed this we've kind of looked at it as the fuel has been kind of a liability that's starting to shift. And uh, I don't know that you'll ever see it actually being sold, but uh, it is being looked at. You know, when we talk on these small modular reactors, they can take some of this fuel and they can, they can basically with very little processing, be able to use that fuel and just use that effectively right in their cores right away and continue to extract energy out of that for, uh, for years to come. So when you do that, it basically, if you took took the fuel and, you know, and everybody gets an idea of, of used fuel um, of this large amount of uh, nuclear waste. So we, we probably need to talk about that a little bit. If you took all the fuel, all the high level waste that, that we've had since 1940 and moving on, you know, since we've, you know, that we've burned in defense areas on the, in the in the generation and did all of that and put that all together and you stack that onto um, onto a football field it would fit on a football field less than 10 feet high so it's a fairly compact amount of fuel fairly heavy uh it's heavier than lead but uh but again it 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 doesn't you know the volume of waste is not that large um but again, you know, when you start taking some of this and looking at the ability to be able to um, use this in some of the new core designs, you can basically, uh, there are some people that are saying you can make, make this, use this fuel for the next 500 years without having to do any additional mining. Hey, um, another question is how is the excess wind generation handled? So uh, when when we have uh, so in, in the in the market uh, the way that the way that plants are rewarded uh, you are we we bid into the market all the time of of the energy and just like anything else you know when you have a high demand um, and a a low supply you know the prices are up and when you have uh, a high supply and a low demand the prices are down and so what the market will do is they will send market signals and they'll send uh you know for for the energy that we produce they're they're paying us um a certain amount of dollars when the wind is blowing very high and it's more and it exceeds the amount of load that we have we'll actually see what's called negative energy pricing and that's where we end up paying uh we as the producer pay to continue to produce versus shutting on down and so what will happen is a lot of times that's what um, uh, that dictates the economics will eventually dictate to what's being run and if we need to if we need to shut plants down and, and coast back we'll end up doing that because the economics um, uh, are, 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 are fighting against you you know so in, in our particular case you know if if um, if the inner negative energy if it got to be negative twenty dollars and I said we were 800 megawatts, you would take um, 20 times 800. And for every hour, that's what we would be paying. That's the amount that we'd be paying uh, to continue to operate. Uh, our other choice is we could shut down and then we would avoid that particular cost. But then if if uh, the wind dies down, we we would have to be able to ramp up very quickly. And so that's, that's constant um, economic game to, uh, to be able to keep uh, keep the energy balanced. Okay, we have a few more questions. Um, this is two questions. I'm going to go ahead and combine them. They're from the same person, Brian. Thank you for your questions. What's the projected cost to keep operating versus decommissioning the plant? And then related to that, 
if the end goal is to help the climate, why is there so much concern about cost and funding behind it? Or is there issues with getting funding for this type of thing? So uh, let, 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 me, let me start off by saying from a, from a funding source, you know, the, the district uh, certainly has, has no issues and, and the board of directors has supported Cooper Nuclear Station very well as far as from a funding. But ultimately when we when we get to the end and and you know we we look at um, we look at making sure that not only is the energy affordable not only is the energy clean but the energy has to be reliable it has to be resilient we look at all all factors you know so our our goals are that we would be sustainable be resilient be reliable and we would be affordable uh, because that's what we we need to do to be able to for for users to be able to go. It doesn't do us any good if we were to um, have ten times the prices on on electrical power. You know um, th that that would cause a lot of hardship for uh, uh, for a lot of a lot of individuals. It would uh, of course hit into the economy. So that's something that we need to make sure that we're not only affordable. And we're constantly balancing that with reliability because it doesn't do us any good to be affordable if we're not there all the time. And then also to be resilient so that when you have things like uh, Winter Storm Uri, that we're able to continue to operate through that, as well as being sustainable uh, so that we'd be able to uh, manage, the, manage the planet, manage the climate. Okay, and then the other part of that question was, what's the projected cost to keep operating the plant versus decommissioning it? So um, overall, when we look at the investment, uh, the, the the investment to dismantle is is definitely a lot higher. I'm not at liberty to actually use all those numbers, but um, we we've we've put our our estimate together of what we would have to invest into the plant to to continue to operate, it, we're talking about something in the range of um, um, much less than what it would cost to generate to uh, to build a new plant. So let's put it that way. Yeah. The, the cost the cost for dismantling uh, start ranging closer towards what it would cost to build a brand new plant. Mm -hmm. So we're talking literally, you know, um, significantly significantly more. It's up in the billions of dollars to, to uh, decommission the plant completely. Wow. Okay, and then we have two more questions. Uh, what are the most prohibited factors in the operation of existing plants and the building of new facilities? Why can't fuel be stored off site of these facilities? Uh, the fuel could be stored off site. Uh, it is just easier, it's controlled. Uh, the, the fuel would have to be stored someplace where it could be um, guarded, where you would have protect it from radiological sabotage. And so based upon that, the best location has been right at the site because we have our, we have a security force there that is uh, second to none and able to uh, maintain that. Um, one of the things we are looking at is having some centralized storage someplace where you would take, uh, take the fuel from four or five plants and put them all there at the same place. That is something that the Department of Energy is looking at. Uh, the Department of Energy is uh, um, is tasked by law to come up with a longer term storage solution so that it wouldn't be staying just at the sites. But uh, currently, that's uh, run into some roadblocks for them. They're currently still trying to work their way through. They're working on uh, um, uh, getting getting some locations, getting some interim locations to be able to start uh, doing that, and and because right now the, you know the the economics, um, they are we we have a they have a contract right now that uh, said that they would be able to start storing that that they've been tasked with that by the Congress, uh, but haven't been able to do it. So they're currently in breach of their contract, and so the, what they're currently doing is they are paying for our storage for us to store the fuel there on site. The costs that we would incur, they actually reimburse us by having it there. So longer term, they would like to be able to do that, but until they have a facility and they have a way of doing it, 
and uh, uh, work through all the permits to be able to move that. Um, it's it's stored here, and again, it's being kept very very safe, um, um, and, and and can be safe for some time frame. In fact, if you look in uh, up in um, Maine, uh, there are some plants that have been shut down. They've been decommissioned completely. The only thing that's left is uh, their fuel storage that they currently have that's sitting there. Everything else has been, uh, you know, you have a drone flying over and uh, you see all these green trees until you get to the clearing where their their fuel pad is, is sitting and they have a security force that's monitoring that. They're watching that, they're guarding that, they're monitoring it. Um, again, it's just kind of an ineffective, uh, inefficient way to manage uh, uh, fuel. There's much more cost-effective ways of doing it by consolidating them together. Okay, and then we have one more question and then one more just after that came in. Um, uh, Desiree says she's very interested in the new smaller mini reactors for future development. How can the average citizen be involved in this discussion going forward? So um, again, uh, you know, if you're if you're interested, there there is the the um, advanced nuclear form is is meant to be open for all stakeholders and to provide some of that information. And, and uh, I, I would strongly encourage someone to um, to to go to the website, look at that, and see what information is in there. Uh, there are the the advanced nuclear coalition is trying to engage uh, groups and be able to talk about that. I certainly would be more than willing of doing that, of going in if there's additional information, you know, they can certainly send the information towards me. Uh, and and I would be more than happy of providing that as we've been going, as we're going forward. I think that the, um, uh, the, the future of, uh, uh, of energy, you know, we're, we're wanting to be wanting to make sure that, um, um, that, that it's going to be reliable, that it's going to be affordable. And we're really kind of monitoring. We're really kind of excited about the opportunities as we go forward. But again, anything I can do to be able to share and help that, I certainly will. Okay. Um, and then we have uh, quite the serious question. How does the operation of Cooper compare to the operation of uh, unfortunately disasters such as Chernobyl and Love Canal? Uh, what's the risk at Cooper of a meltdown? The same issue that they've had, we've had in the past of those plants. So that is the you know when when you when you look at um, the, the the best way that I can I can put this is um, you know my when you're working at the plant you have an area that you call uh, the um, uh, emergency planning zone that surrounds that and when you look at the people that are living within that emergency planning zone. Those are my friends. Those are my family. I believe it to be very, very safe, or I wouldn't have my family there. So, okay. I, I mean, I don't know how else to 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 answer that. But the the problem is, is that we we need to provide. You know, in the past, we have not um, the nuclear industry felt that um, you know if we kept our heads down, kept out of the limelight, that was probably the best. We've we did ourselves a disservice there. I believe it's very safe. Uh, you take a look at the safety records of nuclear power, put it up against any of the, you know, any other industrial, any of the other power plants. Uh, you know, you know, as far as going in there, is there, is there a lot of energy there? Do we have to respect it? Yes, very much so. Um, that is what all 600 people on the site we we have that shared value to make sure that we're constantly maintaining that plant, that we're providing uh, the utmost reverence for the core so that, you know, we don't take shortcuts. We work very, very hard to make sure we make big things, you know, uh, out of uh, out of small things, you know, somebody um, uh, makes some, you know, we can't have any sort of error. We constantly monitor that. Uh, now, with that stated, we have we have a lot of systems. We have backups to backups to backups to make sure so that in the event something did happen, you know, it would it would go in there. But again, we don't want to rely on any of those. So we don't want to challenge any of those barriers that we have. You know, having defense in depth is really the key that we have to be able to maintain it. So there's always a respect that you have to have for the core. 
but from a safety standpoint, when you when you look at some of the other uh, issues that have occurred, could that occur? Uh, certainly, but not if if we're doing our job, what we're what we need to be doing to maintaining the plant, uh, keeping it going forward. Um, you you would not see those sorts of things. You know, if you look at you know, and everybody always has Chernobyl in mind. But the Chernobyl design was completely different than what we have. Um, if you recall at the very beginning, you know, we, we work in a light water reactor that was a completely different design. It was a carbon um, pile design. And without getting real geeky and all the, all the words and everything that was in there, if you remember at the very beginning, I had that slow neutron that hits. Uh, if I don't have water that surrounds the core, when the thing breaks apart when the when the I split the atoms they come out as fast I said that won't carry this that won't well, I have to slow those down to be able to get them to interact with the next neutron that has to be done with water so if I run out of water the reaction actually shuts down so it's really just a matter then of take, making sure I'm getting all the heat out so um, something like the order of Chernobyl where they didn't even have a containment you know I didn't get into some of the safety systems that are are at Cooper, but you know, I have a primary containment that completely surrounds the core such that, you know, any pipe that would break in there and all the energy would be contained, it would stay within there. Uh, surrounding all the primary containment is what I call a secondary containment. It's always maintaining everything at a negative pressure so that everything is always being monitored, always being filtered. Uh, so I don't see any sort of releases. Chernobyl didn't have that. They basically, you know, it was it was based. There was no containment structure, and so when when that got away from them, instead of the reaction shutting down like it would in a in a light water reactor like they are in the United States, it actually accelerated, and that's what caused the pro caused the issues over in Chernobyl. So the basic designs are completely different, and and you would not see that sort of an event. Now, with that stated, obviously there are, you know, we always have to be monitoring that. You have things like Three Mile Island, you know, which had a human person getting in the way and causing problems. In the moment we, uh, you know, had any of those, including including even uh, Chernobyl, you know, the, the nuclear industry looks at all of that and says, okay, how did that happen? What occurred? Even if it's a different technology, what is it that we have to do so we don't have anything very similar or even close to that ever occur here? Even when things like 9-11 uh, occurred, we undergo great scrutiny of what do we have, um, what, um, how would we uh, cope with a wide-scale uh, uh, catastrophe, fires, those sorts of things. You know, so again, you know, we we constantly look at and put, and based on all of those, are constantly monitoring and upgrading our plant to make sure that we're able to uh, safely um, uh, mitigate any of the consequences of anything very similar at all to that. So, I don't know I, if that answered the question or not. But. Yeah, I feel like that answered the question well. I I learned from that one, so that was great. Um, do you feel like you have time for one more question? Certainly. Okay, uh, we have a question from Lance. What are the obstacles to rapidly expanding nuclear power generation? Since we've gone over how it's safe, it's it's a very good source of energy. What are the obstacles that we have to expanding it quickly? So the, the biggest the biggest obstacles right now are uh, are really cost. Um, you know, we um, we. One of the reasons we're looking at the small modular is they, they put in an advanced reactor that just it's just came online and they're currently working on uh, going to commercial operation in Georgia. And it's the first one that's been built for some time, but it um, they had a lot of delays in getting it built. It was supposed to be uh, actually online and operating about uh, six years ago, and it's just now coming on had a lot of overruns. It was originally slated to be uh, to cost basically uh, $2 billion B, with a B. Uh, and it's currently running at about $14 billion. So they've had cost overruns that are in there. Uh, it's a very large plant. It's about 1,400 megawatts. It's even larger than Cooper. So it gives you some sort of idea. 
So it, it really is the, uh, the, the cost and being able to get uh, people in a workforce that's able to, uh, uh, to do, you know, to be able to not only build the plants, but also operate the plants as we go forward. So we're very much looking at, you know, from in Nebraska, we're looking at going out and, and working with colleges and and with the local schools and working on getting getting that pipeline of people to come in to be able to operate the plant as we go forward and be able to uh, continue this you know uh, well into the future you know into the late uh, 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 2000s so um, we're we're that that's probably the biggest item you know uh, the we're getting a, a very strong workforce that you can get behind it getting something that's reliable and able to be done predictably uh, on schedule um, and and with with quality so okay thank you so much for answering so many questions Dan thank you so much for being here tonight uh thank you to everybody who came I feel like this turned out really well tonight so thank you everybody we're gonna go ahead and wrap up now uh so yeah thank you so much